David, it's it's great to have you back um, for the purposes of chairing this meeting. And um, I, th there are a couple of things I think which <laughs> will uh, possibly be of interest to you, and not the least of which is something which I think is probably going to be a bit of an annoyance, um, because this presentation, this seminar, is basically me trying to shift position. Um, and I think this is one of the things that, um, in a very kind of, you know, endeared kind of a way, um, drives David to distraction about me, is that I'm always in the position, I'm always trying to shift position, I'm trying to accommodate uh, different views, I don't stick with a line, um, I, I'm sort of guilty of a I, for me, very pleasurable and always very challenging hither and thither. Um, but um, and hence the fact that I, I'm ugh, at least 25 years into an academic career and I don't feel as if I've particularly got a specialism. And I think the specialism, if I've got anything, is changing my mind, um, which I guess makes theatre probably the only amenable vehicle for whatever skills I have as a scholar. Anyway, um, this is, a, this is a, a presentation about um, a project which began back in about 2018 as a series of um, discussions between three of us at the time, between uh, me and David Sills Jones and Hugh Penarth Jones. And the plan at that point um, when I came on board, the plan was to see if we could uh, together be a kind of creative team responsible for making a, a feature film. This is great for me because I hadn't been involved with anything like that before. Um, and it must have marked a stage of true desperation on their part to ask somebody with absolutely no experience um, to be involved as a director on this. But I thought, right, this is great. Um, so shortly after the first conversation, I went and read the novel. Um, and shortly after I'd read the novel, uh, David Sills Jones emigrated to New Zealand. And so that created a, a rather different sort of set of parameters for this project. It made the, the, the question of making a feature film um, very different. Uh, it created a very different context for it. Um, so that was that was a, kind of the, the first thing that happened. Um, then we decided that we would meet up and we would do a sort of session of work at a conference um, of the Screen Research Network, Screenwriters Research Network, SRN, in Porto in September 2019, you know, Portugal in September, why wouldn't you? Um, so that was when we met up and that was a kind of, um, a, uh, it was just me and David at that point. Um, and we talked about what could be done, what we had done and what the way forward might be. Um, then we went our separate ways, promising to, you know, meet up again and to try and make progress with this uh, project. Um, and then 2019 stopped and 2020 started happening. And everything I think that we had proposed up to that point looked very, very different from the optic of 2020. Um, so we haven't been in touch really about this project for, for a good long time until I, um, contacted uh, David in New Zealand on Teams the other day um, and we had a, a conversation and we had a, I recorded a series of interviews with him about um, our original approach to the project and some of the aspects, some of the attitudes that uh, might sort of arise as a result of what's happened in the meantime. But I think that's, it's, it's a significant thing in itself. I mean, that's, this is why I've got dared to put this up for a, a research seminar, is that I think the, you know, the shattering of a kind of unified plan and the um, overtaking of certain aspects of that plan by contemporary, uh, you know, events 
contemporary and a new changed reality, which means, of course, that we're doing all of this over Teams and we are not in you know, direct contact with each other in a room. Um, that breakage, I think, is in itself is, is significant and it's something which I want to think more about and it's something that I want to try and incorporate into the way that I talk about this project at all. So this is a sort of first step in doing that. Um, I will present what I can present about this and give you as much context, hopefully in as clear a way as possible, um, about the project and what we managed to do. Um, and then at the earliest possible opportunity, I think I will stop and I will play some section of uh, the interview with uh, David. Um, and then I will try and, and answer questions. So that's that's what I plan to do. Um, so I'll try and keep an eye on the clock as I do this. Um, but let's I'll just just go through some of the stuff, some of the background stuff and um, some of the attitude, uh, the, some of the aspects we have discussed already as a as a group. All right. Um, so this is the process of returning to this novella by Arger Archons, Kaflogion. Um, first of all, Kaflogion is, uh, it's not just the name of a novel. It was not originally the name of a novel. It's the name of a place. Um, and it goes back an awful long way. So this is back in the fifth century. Um, the lands administered by a post-Roman ruler called Kineva. Um, and Kaflogion at that point, according to this map at least, um, refers to this area here at the tip of the Llin Peninsula. All right, um, if we look at six, uh, 15th century, um, well, this isn't a 15th century map of Wales, but it's uh, derived from information about the 15th century. Um, again, you can see that Caflogion is here defined as a commot, a kumud, um, which is, I think, well, it's, it's up to about a third of a hundred, a kantrev. So the kantrev, the hundred in this case, would have been clean. Um, and you can see that it's made up of a, of a number of different um, areas. I think what's one of the things that's interested in here, and I'm delighted that Mike Pearson is is at this uh, is in the audience for this because it, it it plays, I think, to this interest which Mike had uh, a number of years ago about choreography. Um, and the way that we negotiate and create and uh, acknowledge boundaries around our um, areas of dwelling. Um, so the, these are boundaries which are not sort of marked on the on the earth, um, and they're not necessarily anymore marked formally by signposting or anything. They are just there as matters of lived experience. People understand that they move from one um, kind of sub area to another. Um, so no doubt there would have been some kind of administrative um, significance to the boundaries around Kaflogion here in the 15th century, but they are no longer um, observed. Kaflogion is occasionally still used um, for uh, the for groups of cultural groups or choirs, um, you know, theater companies, people like that, who come together in that area. So, you know, there is still some kind of residual sense of bro kaflogion about that area in Northwest Wales. Um, so we have to move on then and think about the way that kaflogion was um, taken up by Argerat Jones. Um, so we do need to say a little bit about Argerat Jones um, here, because I think there are certain things about his biography and about his work that are, that are significant to us. So he was born in 1934. Um, he rejoiced under the rather wonderful name of Robert Gerat Hamlet Jones. Um, he was a very well-known poet and prose writer, cricket, critic and academic. Um, he was a very good cricketer as well. Um, born in that area around uh, Caflogion in the Lean Peninsula, born at Nevin, which is a little bit further north than that 15th century map would uh, have shown. 
Um, one of the, the important things about his life, though, um, which is worth noting here, and one might think has a kind of relationship to the novel, um, was that he was um, educated at Shrewsbury, um, and as it says here, at Denstone College in Staffordshire. So he was sent away to a boarding school in Shrewsbury at the age of 10, um, when he was largely monoglot, he didn't speak any English at that point in his life, um, having been brought up in a in a completely sort of Welsh speaking area. But he was brought up by a family, I guess, who was dominated by his father, who was an Anglican vicar, um, who had a visceral dislike um, of Welsh nonconformist chapel culture for various reasons. Um, so he sent his son away to be educated in Shrewsbury. And he, he was a pretty drastic step at the time. Um, and I think it probably, it, it may have been a sort of, you know, a cultural crisis which drove the poor man, uh, Argerat Jones, to, you know, to being a writer in order to be able to cope with this incredible experience of being uprooted and exiled. Um, so he was sent to Shrewsbury to school and then to a minor public college, public school up in, in Staffordshire. And it wasn't until um, he undertook his uh, BA degree that he came back to Wales to study. So he then went to study English at the University of College of North Wales in Bangor. Um, and also in Bangor, he completed an MA thesis on the work of Robert Graves. So I think that that experience of education is rather formative and it's something that we should bear in mind when it comes to thinking about the, the, the nature of Caflogion as a text um, and also thinking about some of the characters in Caflogion. Um, thereafter, his, his working life took him uh, to several different places. He, he worked as a as a writer throughout his throughout his life, but he was also involved in education. Uh, firstly, as a warden in Mandeville College in Jamaica, which was very important to him um, as an experience. And really, along with his education in a foreign land, um, gave him a, a kind of perspective on his own mm, area of upbringing, his own sort of Viltir Squar, which was quite at odds in some way with some of the prevailing uh, tropes about belonging to places that were common within Welsh literature at the time. Um, and certainly that, that period in Jamaica um, reflected itself in some of his written work because he did do two volumes of um, sort of autobiography, as it were, about his time in Jamaica. Um, and also an interest in uh, the condition of life in the developing world um, alongside his interest in, in Welsh literature. So he worked at Mandeville College in Jamaica. He was a teacher at Sir J uh, Thomas John's School in Amloch. Um, he was at the Department of Education back in the days when we were the University College of Wales, Aberystwyth. Um, that was in sort of the late 50s, early 60s. Um, then he became the warder of Llandovery College um, and then returned to Aberystwyth as the head of extramural studies. And then finally, um, while he was I think still, he still had a, a link with Aberystwyth University, um, he was the warder of Greganog Hall when it was still a kind of University of Wales conference centre. Um, and I do remember he had quite a, a close relationship with uh, the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies back in the mid 1990s. Um, so I think he was one of the people who was instrumental in the very early days of um, the degree in Film and Television Studies that we were developing at that time in the mid 90s. Um, we could do a whole list of his written work. Um, but he was quite prolific, so I won't go the whole way through any uh, whole way through it by any means. Um, one of the, the important things is that he twice won the National Silver Prose Medal of Vedal Rudyev, 
um, which is one of the sort of premier competitions in the Eisteddfod. Um, and uh, he won it in 1977 with his novel Triptych. And then importantly, from our point of view, he won it in 1979 for his novel Cathlogion, which I will come to in a minute. You'll hear more about this in a minute. Um, but on being educated in, in my misprint, unfortunately, England, um, he said this, and I think this is this is important as a kind of little touchstone for us. Wales, for me, he said, was a hearth, a home, a wonderful world, hidden, separate from the world of, world of school, a proud possession of my own, a secret room that my English friends knew nothing about. And I think um, that experience, I feel, though I, you know, I, I stand warned about these sort of direct translations from someone's biography into their creative work. But I think, you know, you, it's it's hard not to see some kind of shadow of that experience and some kind of uh, framework from that experience in Kaflogion. So um, to talk about Kaflogion and the novel, here it is. Um, it's Look at it. Well, end on. You can see it, it's not very thick. It's a sort of novella, um, as I think is only appropriate for the literary prose medal competition in the National Estetics. They they don't award them for kind of full length, full scale novels. They are that that medal is awarded for words, you know, sixty thousand words. Um, so it's a short novel. It's a, it's a fairly sort of compact piece. It could really be a lot longer, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll leave it as it is for now. We'll discuss it, what it uh, presents to us. Um, it is a kind of, I guess it's a dystopian science fiction novel set in, uh, it's an indistinct date, but I think it is kind of middle to late 21st century. Um, and what it proposes um, is that at that time, Britain is divided up into five regions, um, which he doesn't sort of specify where the regions are, but I imagine it kind of in his imagination, it might equate to uh, regions which look a little bit like that. So he, Britain is divided up into five regions. Um, and it is one part of a broader neoliberal and very nastily authoritarian United States of Europe, um, which is one of the real surprises when you read this work from 1979 in view of uh, more recent political events. So the United States of Europe is seen as uh, you know, generally a pretty bad um, anti-communitarian kind of structure. Um, and one of those regions contains Wales, I guess, um, it, even though Wales as such is not named at any point in the novel. Uh, it's just merely a repository for a place called the city. So for this region, um, we have the city. Um, at one point, it uh, it discusses uh, one of the characters returning to the sort of administrative hub, um, and that's called CF6. Um, I don't think that postcode still exists, but it, it sort of broadly equates to Cardiff and Barry and the Vale. Um, so it's it's kind of that sort of place. Well, actually, it is more just Barry and the Vale, actually. It's, the CF6 is not present in, in actually in the city of Cardiff. Um, but certainly what we've got is this idea that there's this big urban sprawl down in the south of Wales. Um, and that urban sprawl has uh, drawn uh, through a series of um, very harsh laws of limitation. Um, it has drawn the population into it. Um, and the countryside beyond the realms of the city has become largely uninhabited. Um, and anyone who basically tried to carry on living outside the city um, has found themselves in a great deal of privation. Um, sort of, you know, groups of people have tried over the years um, 
starting at about, I think, 1991, he suggests, when the laws of limitation first come in. Uh, they tried to leave the city and go and live in the country and get away from the repressive atmosphere of the city, but they haven't been able to and, you know, they've never been heard of again. Several groups of people have just, you know, starved to death. Um, towns um, throughout Wales have therefore just sort of fallen into ruin. Um, and early on in the novel, we have a story of a helicopter ride um, whereby a filmmaker from the city called Garth flies out of the main urban centre and flies over the town of Brecon, or the city of Brecon, actually, because it's got a cathedral, um, and, you know, looks down on it and basically sees most of the city just kind of abandoned and crumbling, um, except for the the kind of the large cathedral in the middle. So, Caflogion is a settlement on the far forgotten outskirts. And uh, although he doesn't say where it is directly, it does equate to um, this area in Northwest Wales because they have, uh, they have their settlement somewhere in the midst of this land. And then also further up the coast, they've got a port which they use, which is at Porthdyn Llain, which is just near uh, Morvanevin. So, uh, Caflogion is on the far outskirts. Um, they trade, they support themselves uh, independently. They are a kind of self-sufficient community. Um, uh, but they also sustain themselves or have sustenance with, uh, by having trade links, not with the city, but with uh, Ireland. Um, and Ireland, since the late 1980s, has been united um, and it's also opted out. It did not opt in at any point to the United States of Europe. So Ireland is a sort of freedom loving country uh, across the sea from Caflogion. So how it's managed to keep itself independent from the rest of Europe, we don't know, uh, it's not mentioned, but um, that's that's one of the conditions. And it allows them to make more of a living for themselves by trading with Ireland. Um, and also then there's another sort of independent settlement up in Cair Gubi. Now, uh, it, it's slightly different from Hollyhead, um, I imagine, because he makes a point of saying it as two words. When, in Welsh, Cargabi is one word. So I imagine this is not necessarily uh, fully equivalent to the town of Hollyhead, the port of Hollyhead, uh, but rather it is, you know, I think it just, just reminds us of that place because of the use of the name. Um, so here's, uh, here's David's synopsis of the, of the novella. Um, and I know that I have to kind of tell this story as well as I can. So I'll stick to what he's got here. Um, so when the city forbids people to live in the country, as I've already said, a small band of visionaries set up an off-grid community called Caflogion, uh, or in Caflogion, which is led by a guy called Yeyan. Yeyan was one of 12 um, who set themselves apart from the city and try and find a place where they can create an independent community uh, because they are disgusted by the atomization of existence within the city and also the fact that the city has a sort of relentlessly and damagingly competitive ethic um, and they want to live in a more communitarian kind of a way. So 12 men um, come together and uh, they are people with very particular skills, both academic and um, practical. Um, and so some of them come with their families, some of them come with, with uh, their children, some of them come just with their marriage partners. Um, and Yeyan actually abandons his family in order to join that band of 12. Um, and he's the only one who's left alive of that band of 12 at the, at the time when this, when the novel takes place. Um, so they've been there since about 1991, um, when they left the city. And for the first 10 years, uh, those 12 people decided that what they wanted to do was to try and organize some kind of a community. And they would not allow anybody else in, um, and there was an embargo on having any more children. Okay, so the, nobody who had a family up there with them um, was to have any children within that period of trying to establish 
and trying to set up the community. Um, so it is quite strict in its own way about you know how you are to to live your life. So it's not a sort of you know an, a, an idyll of freedom. Um, the question of living a communitarian existence exacts very particular requirements of the people who live there. So um, those were the first generation. Their children are also people who arrived and were invited in after that first 10 year period are the second generation. Um, and the novel takes place at the point just after the point where the first member of the third generation of Kaflogion, who is Sean, a son of Alin and Meir, um, is born. So at the time of that child's birth, it is decided from within the community that it is now time to show the morally vapid city, as David puts it, how life ought to be lived. So what they do is that they do something which is rather drastic and, as it turns out, disastrous. Um, and they make themselves known to certain elements within the city. They seek to make contact with the city. And what happens is that Alin um, is sent as an emissary to contact a famous city filmmaker called Garth. Um, and they invite him up from the city to Kaflobion in order that he might make a film about their life there. So this is, um, I, yes, the, 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 it comes from a kind of moral imperative to do this. Um, but at the same time, it's there as it's you could think of it as slightly hubristic um, or you could think of it as something which has got a kind of rather troubling death wish attached to it. And Yeyan is a figure um, whose actual motives for allowing and seeking to further this contact with a city is never really fully examined. Um, so anyway, Garth flies up to uh, Kaflogion in a helicopter, the filmmaker arrives, the ensuing film after it is made um, scares the city's secret services. Um, Garth, while he's there, is quite you know, surprised and impressed by what he sees. Um, he sees that these people's way of life is, um, is very different from his own. Um, they are given far more regularly to quite sort of strenuous physical activity. So they look physically different. They spend far more of their time out of doors. Um, so they're sort of, you know, darker and more ruddy in terms of their complexion um, and they wear very different clothes. So their lives are basically, um, as far as Garth is concerned, sort of devoted to the practicalities of keeping themselves alive as a community. And I think that's one of the things that he feels is very, very different between the life in a city and the life in Kaflogion as a community. Um, as with, you know, all descriptions of kind of utopian universes, um, this place, this place Kaflogion has got within it a very strong sense of purpose and order, it would seem. And that idea of purpose and order has completely suffused the lives of the people who live there. Um, so anyway, he goes back, very impressed with this, to the city and makes his film, um, thinking, of course, that it is just going to be greeted as a sort of curio and this exotic sort of entity far away from the city, which the city had basically forgotten about, wasn't bothered with. Um, it would just appeal to a very select elite audience and that nobody would really be particularly worried about it. But what happens, of course, is that secret services look at this and immediately see the danger in what the life of the people of Kaflogion poses to the residents of the city. This alternative view of life is something that they're desperately worried about and they seek to suppress it. So what they do is that they tell Garth, you have to go back to Kaflogion um, and you have to go back with an emissary from the Secret Services, a guy who is only known as, well, no, he's known as the Redhead, usually a Pengoch, um, but he tells Garth to call him Terry. Um, 
that is, of course, not his real name. But anyway, that, he, they, they go together back to Caflogion, um, and Garth has to sort of tell the people of Caflogion, sorry, there's a couple of, there's another couple of days filming we needed to do. Um, and he's not allowed to tell them why he is back and what he's got, uh, why he's brought this guy with him. Um, so um, they arrive um, and they do the filming. And then after he goes back um, with the redhead and after the redhead has a number of interviews with the leaders of Caflogion as a settlement, um, the decision is made um, at the, the Ministry of Control uh, that this is too dangerous a place for them to allow to survive. Um, and they decide, or the, the, the tendency is that they're going to decide to try and get rid of this settlement. Um, in the meantime, Caflogion's leader, Yayan, and his lieutenants, as David has described me here, Stefan and Mike, they consider armed rebellion because they are very suspicious about what's now actually going on. Um, and following a really rather disastrous conversation between Yayan and the redhead, um, they think our days are numbered. So uh, they consider armed rebellion. Um, and this conversation is overheard by um, the secret services in the city because when they went back, the redhead dropped bugs everywhere. Uh, Yeyan secretly warns only Alin about what he thinks is about to happen, Alin and Meyer, um, and he tells them to leave. Um, and um, well, he doesn't really tell them to rebuild Caflogion elsewhere, um, but that's the implication of what he says. So he, because he doesn't give them a, you know, a, a pass to go to the port and to leave for Ireland or some other, you know, pre-existing place. He sends them a call a, along this sort of shattered road into the middle of nowhere and says, start again. Um, so. Alan and Meyer, they, this, this, the end of the story is that Alan and Meyer escape into the, into the desolate Welsh hills just in time as Caflogion is then destroyed in a series of air raids along with all its inhabitants. Um, so that's that's the basic, uh, the, the, the story of the novel. That's what we were dealing with. I think I've dealt with most of those things um, in the course of my synopsis. I, I should really kind of get on. Um, a couple of things here, though, are um, significant. And there's one of the things, some of the things that make the novel rather um, a, a, a curio, really, I suppose. Um, as a character, Alin, this guy who is uh, given the capacity to escape at the end, he isn't a sort of ideal candidate for this job. Um, throughout the novel, um, which is basically divided up, I, this is probably going to be far too small for you to see, but um, it's divided up into a series of, uh, I don't know, I suppose it's this way, yeah. It's divided up into a series of sort of, you know, um, chapter sections, which are narrated by different figures, different characters. Um, so there isn't a sort of one uh, consistent one narrator voice going through all of it. Um, and what happens is that Alan is kind of presented as a slightly hysterical, very intuitive, and certainly not given to articulacy. So his his passages um, his passages always reflect on the fact that he isn't really. Um, very capable of telling he has a distinct sense that his uh, sorry the, the uh, microphone is muting and I'm going to throw me but he he has a distinct sense of dread and that things are going to go very 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 badly um then uh, towards the end of the novel, there's two things that happen. First of all, Yeyan, in conversation with Alin, says he kind of knew for a long time that this was going to be inevitable and that Caflogion was going to be destroyed. 
Um, so its destruction was going to be inevitable. Uh, he knows this and he didn't really do anything about it. So it really throws Yeyan's character into a kind of relief and you think, well, what is this guy? Um, is he, you know, is he some kind of uh, great visionary seer, this sort of benign pacifist who just thinks, you know, que sera, sera. Um, if they do come and get us, then so be it. Um, or is he some kind of death cult eco-fascist? I am, you know, it's, it's very hard to tell. Um, and to return to my original point about uh, Argerath Jones and his father, it's very interesting that this, you know, Yeyan is the father figure in this community and he's extremely kind of um, ambiguous as a character in terms of his morality then. Um, and the final thing about it is that it's a significant little detail, but just as Garth leaves the community for the last time, following uh, the disastrous argument between Redhead and um, Yeyan, as he leaves, um, feeling deeply implicated in the impending destruction of this place, he looks back at the house where the argument took place, where Yeyan lives, and he sees on the table, um, or he sees that Yeyan is back reading a book by uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, um, who was, uh, uh, I think, even at the time, is a highly controversial figure, um, a Jesuit priest, a paleontologist, who was very committed to the idea of some kind of interface between his own Christian view of the world uh, and of matters of the spirit, plus the, uh, you know, the geological origins of the earth. Um, and so he created this idea of uh, the noosphere, um, wherein he believed basically that um, ideas in the world, people's ideas, human ideas, were sort of capable of forming themselves into another sort of biosphere, an alternative biosphere, um, within the very fabric of material life on Earth. Um, so he is now kind of regarded as uh, in sort of an appalling pseudoscientist. But he did, he did sort of um, work uh, very thoroughly within the world of uh, paleontology, and he was partly responsible um, for the discovery of Peking Man in China, where he spent many, many years. Um, so, but this is thrown in to the novel towards the very, very end, and it's something which makes it read, I think, very differently now from what it did uh, back in 1979, because of the fact now that you've got uh, such concerns about uh, pseudoscience and denial of, you know, science, uh, fake news, alternative truth, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so from being something of a kind of uh, stroke, utopian stroke dystopian novel, which was, you know, awarded the medal, which made it, you know, representative of possibly the most respectable uh, right in uh, in relation to the Welsh letters at the time, um, it now looks, it's got these sort of very, very weird angles. First of all, you know, the fascistic United States of Europe, um, and secondly, an, an implicit celebration of the work of Pierre Théard de Chardin. Um, so, this, that, that has taken me ages. Um, what we did, and I'm not going to go through this um, very in very much detail now because I don't think I've got the time. Um, but what we did first of all was that uh, David proposed a different kind of um, synopsis and treatment for the work, um, and that reflected the fact that uh, we were not thinking of this as the novel for an aesthetic competition anymore. We were thinking about it as a as a feature film, and as such, it had to be changed so that it met the kind of needs of um, popular wide audience um, work, although, as David said, it was a slightly at the arty end of that, um, we thought, we hoped. 
So we made a he, he made a, a new version of it, a new treatment of it, an adaptation of it um, to uh, meet the needs of the Film Company Development Fund. And what happened there was that it was translated, as it were, from being some kind of neoliberal um, dystopia, which was being relieved by a, a promise of a better communitarian future. Um, what happened was that um, he decided that Kaflogion would be a sort of very, very furthest outpost of the city at a time of ecological crisis, um, which you know he really hyped up and souped up a bit. Um, first of all, to say that um, communication between the city and the outskirts uh, was made difficult because of some kind of natural interference uh, from quickly growing forests, um, which stopped telecommunication signals from being sent and received. So Kaflogion was just a sort of outlying community, but it was a sort of very big farm, which is there in the original novel. Um, and what happened was that they were um, serviced together once a week by a train which came up from the city, which then they sort of loaded up with crops and artifacts and which left a certain amount of stuff for them. Um, but largely their, their lives uh, revolved around the business of supply, supplying the train. Um, secondly, uh, and this is one of the things which really went up in the air <laughs> in 2020, was that for the, for the purposes of the feature film, we decided um, that the early sections of it would uh, be dedicated to um, shots of people kind of laboriously suiting up in protective gear um, because of the fact that uh, the, the farm itself, um, the crops, while they were still living and growing out of the earth, were producing some kind of toxic byproduct uh, some kind of natural spores, which made them you know, deeply dangerous for people to be around. So what we had was this rather nice dystopian view, this dystopian vision of um, people growing crops who are being outside farming, uh, but in real big, thick biohazard suits. This was before, of course, uh, the advent of... Um, <laughs> PPE as uh, something which we are all now rather concerned with. Um, so uh, what happens there is what the, what the um, uh, film treatment suggested uh, was that after the weekly train arrives from the city to take food back to the starving urban multitude, along with it came Garth, the filmmaker. So he came along really without any kind of uh, warning it just came up to turn to be someone who was documenting the city. So um, he was uh, a kind of intruder into the peace of the community. Um, but also what we wanted to do by that was to sort of reflect on what happens when a story is told and how does telling a story affect the status of the thing that you're telling the story about. And you cannot just come in, tell a story, expose the narrative of these people's lives and expect their lives to remain the same. Um, and Garth, as a filmmaker, I think is well aware of that. So storytellers are not sort of just innocent observers. They are implicit and they, you know, they, they are implicated, sorry, in the nature of the object that they are trying to narrate. Um, and what is one of the nice things in the original novel is the fact that Garth gets this sort of um, moment of conversion to thinking how great it is, how great the life of the people in Kaflogion is. But then when he goes back to the city, he kind of forgets about it. Um, he's deeply troubled at the fact that um, his work has got Kaflogion into trouble. Um, but the end of his sort of sections in the original novel um, suggests that he's just thought, oh, well, there you go. That didn't work out so well, did it? I better go on to my next project. And so, and again, I think that's something which is 
um, implicit in the nature of narratives that they do come to an end. Um, and bringing the narrative to a close then creates a moment of disattachment from that narrative um, and a point where you are no longer responsible. Um, and that again, I think is sort of interestingly problematic, particularly when you're trying to look at it from an eco-critical point of view, um, which was increasingly what we were trying to do and increasingly one of the things I find very, very difficult. Um, but anyway, um, so that's, that's the basic thing that we outlined as far as the narrative of the film was concerned. I looked at it and I thought, okay, so there are, there are a number of different possibilities here. Um, so we could look at four or more stories just out of that synopsis. Um, but also, I'll, I'll leap on after that, we thought, okay, if the feature film doesn't happen, then what have we got? So there could be other options for going on with this project in different ways. So it could either be that sort of feature film adaptation and that treatment, um, or it could be um, cheaper to do a kind of found footage feature film, whereby Garth's impounded film um, is secreted in a vault somewhere in the Ministry of Control and sort of comes back years later and people look at it and think, what the hell is this? Um, so it's a, it's a it's a film as seen by an audience um, many years later. Um, in that respect, it does have quite interesting parallels with um, a tremendously interesting novel, I think of about 1994 by Robert Llewellyn called Seren Wen Gwyn, White Star on a White Background, which has the same sort of found footage quality about it. Um, so we also thought about uh, the possibility of uh, doing something which is a little bit more multimedia based. So either we could have a kind of feature film in a theatrical location, we could make what we jokingly called Caflogville. Um, so it would be a sort of Dogville type version of Caflogion, um, which is the, the drama as portrayed in a theater studio. Um, or we could do a sort of Goddardian Alphaville type um, mashup of a specific kind of forest location, but then populated by people who are quite obviously actors. Um, so that was that was another possibility. Um, then there was a sort of multimedia theatre performance. Um, and finally, and I just wanted to sort of speculate about this uh, to finish with, is sort of the making of documentary. Um, and what that would be would not really be the story, I'll, I'll zip along here so I can get to some details about this, uh, not really the story of um, the, the novel itself, but the, basically the story about David, and the story about David making an, a film about or trying to make some kind of creative adaptation of his father's novel. Um, and also thinking about um, how the materials available to us were just, you know, there were, it wasn't just this that was our material. Our materials were us, our materials were memories, um, our materials were um, knowledge about particular places in Wales. Um, and in that respect, I also sort of thought about, you know, the, the way in which um, we could just sift through this sort of vast range of just remnants or propositions about a particular project and a particular kind of action. Um, and in order to do that, I'm drawing, of course, from uh, Mike Pearson's work in theatre archaeology. Hello, Mike. Um, anyway, so that was going to be basically the story about Gerald, uh, Gerald Jones and David, and uh, how David felt a particular kind of relationship to the material, and also a particular sort of responsibility to the material. And I think in some ways that is as dramatically interesting as anything within the novel itself. And of course, it would have been deeply insincere of me to sort of stand back and say, I can do that as a director without thinking about my own experience um, of the relationship between myself and my own father. Um, so this 
uh, broader sweep of concerns was also something that came up when we're thinking about the process of adapting this work. Um, and now, of course, we, we can go on with it, um, and it might be the subject of uh, a, a grant application before very long. Um, and the substance of that is basically going to be how do you work uh, creatively together when you're, you know, how was it, 14,000 miles apart? Um, what can you do? What can you not do? How can you turn the things that you can do and things that you can't do into creative aspects of this particular project and to, to creative strengths? Now, at the time, uh, 2019, I thought the possibility of doing that, of course, was you know, extremely interesting and a bit out there. And I wondered if the technology was available to allow us to do it. And here we are in 2020 doing just about everything um, according to this particular kind of technology. Um, so that's it. And I, I, I realise I have gone on far, far too long here um, because I've got a little bit of interview with David, which I wanted to play, um, but I'm not sure that we want to make the time for that or whether I've gone on long enough already.